I'd like to call Jay Olchansky and Dana Goldman to the virtual dais. If you're out there, please uh, show your, turn on your webcams and your microphones for a great session that's coming up on the longevity uh, dividend. These are two folks who, I guess, uh, Jay, I've uh, read your work. Uh, it's not that uh, this wasn't talked about in the last century, but you guys, I think, uh, repopularized it early in this century. And we'd love to hear you. Actually, there isn't a moderator per se here. So I think we're all kind of flies on the wall listening to you guys uh, have a fireside chat amongst yourselves. I certainly want to understand, you know, what is the prospect of this, what seemed like a no-brainer idea? How can we get it to go viral? What are the same or the different circumstances so that we can see uh, better results and uh, uh, increase uh, healthy longevity in our country? Jay, please. Well, I just want to say, first of all, though, you read Jay's work, but did you read my work? So, <laughs> fortunately, some of Jay's work is joint. So, no, go ahead, Jay. Wait, what, what work is that, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, actually, let me let me ask a question. Um, are we able to? Do we need to share our screen? Or because I remember sending a. I'm I'm just using one slide, uh, and if 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 somebody there doesn't have it, I have it. Ah, there we go. It worked. Okay, um, so I'm going to take a couple of minutes. Hey, Dana, is it okay with you if I go first? Yes. <laughs> Why should today be any different? <laughs> All right. Yeah, money's been a. All right. Um, so let me let me start out by uh, assuming that that folks that are uh, watching or listening don't have much experience. Um, in this area. And so let me just take a, a minute to explain what all of this is in a simple and straightforward way as I can. And I would point out, by the way, that the term geroscience, which I've heard throughout the day, and the longevity dividend concept that Dana and I are talking about are exactly the same thing. Um, it is just a different phrase for the same concept. And we didn't originate it. Geroscience didn't uh, uh, come up, you know, that's not a, a unique concept. I will tell you, by the way, just by way of background, that the first exposure that I had to this whole concept and this whole idea, which brought me into the field of aging to begin with, occurred in 19, uh, 1979, believe it or not. It was two years, it was a couple of years after... Um, a meeting that was run by Bernice Newgarden and Bob Haverkurst at the University of Chicago. And they held a, uh, I think it was a National Academy of Sciences meeting that was devoted to this issue of lifespan and health span. Uh, and they were, you know, if you take a look at some of the original articles in that, in the book that came out, um, that inspired a whole lot of thinking. And that's the first formal meeting that I think ever took place on what we are talking about today and some of the language of geroscience and the longevity dividend that we're talking about now goes even a, a decade or two prior to that. So, really, we we're just, we didn't re, we we didn't reinvent anything. We just repackaged it in a somewhat different way. But let me explain the whole concept very quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dana to um, you know correct all my mistakes, which he likes to do as often as possible. So this was uh, from an article that I published. Uh, a few years ago and uh, in, uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it's a really simple concept. All I did was, uh, and this is looking at, at, uh, at this, this whole issue from, from a, a biodemographer's perspective, I basically took a look at, at a life table uh, from 1900 and then a life table from 2016 at the time. And I, I placed it within the context of a ba background of frailty and disability. So the black line represents the distribution of death. This is how many, this is the ages at which deaths would occur for 100,000 female babies born in 1900. Um, and what you could see, of course, is uh, very high infant and child mortality. You can see that maternal mortality bump right around the age of 20, 21. Uh, if you made it past the first couple of decades, you had a decent chance of living it out into your 60s, 70s, and 80s. And back then, life expectancy at birth was about 50. Uh, 50 for women. Uh, it was a little bit less for men. 
Um, what have we done during the course of the 20th century? We have shifted the distribution of death from the young to the old. So now most of the deaths that ordinarily would have occurred at these younger ages, we've saved their lives by reducing infant child mortality. We've redistributed death from the young to the old. Um, and we basically had an opportunity to see the consequences of the biological aging of our bodies. So the rise of many of these diseases and disorders that we see, heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, and so forth, are a consequence of success, not failure, of uh, living long enough uh, for these bodies to exhibit many of these things that go wrong with us. And I place this distribution of death within the context of frailty and disability, which I call the red zone. Um, the red zone, currently anyway, would appear to be uh, largely immutable um, until, of course, we develop an intervention that, that, that influences the biological process of aging, as would the distribution of death not be expected to move that much further into older ages. And by the way, I would point out that this blue line, uh, which is the distribution of death today, has shifted just a tiny bit to the right with a slightly higher uh, amplitude. Um, since this was published and it's not moved very much at all. And it's very hard to move this distribution of death in long lived populations. Basically we're running up against limits to how long these human bodies are basically capable of operating. Doesn't mean we can't intervene. That's what this is all about. But based in the absence of an intervention, this is about it. Um, and of course the danger here is, is that if we continue to push out the envelope of survival, deeper and deeper into the red zone, we will see more frailty and disability among future cohorts of older individuals um, that are surviving deeper into the red zone. So this whole concept of the longevity dividend of geroscience, the idea here is not to push out the blue line. It's not to make us live longer. I know some people wanna live longer and I'm fine with that, great. But really the focus of, of, uh, of this work, of this concept, um, of this, method of communicating in a fundamentally different way is an effort to modulate the red zone. It's to push the, the period of frailty and disability out into uh, later and later ages. So, so it's expressed uh, and exhibited over a shorter and shorter duration of time. So that basically we're extending the period of health span um, in the population. We'll probably live longer as a result uh, I don't think very much longer for reasons that I've explained in many manuscripts in the past, which I'm happy to discuss. But lifespan, I think, is not the goal anymore. I think it's health span that's really um, what's important here. And I would point out before I turn this over to Dana, that uh, Dana and I and others published an article in uh, Health Affairs in 2013, where we documented the economic effects of all of this. And I think Correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, Dana. Um, uh, I think we grossly underestimated the economic value, grossly underestimated economic value of the benefits of slowing down aging. And we, you know, there's no better evidence for this than what's going on with COVID now. And uh, the implication, the influence of modulating aging uh, on this older population and their response to COVID. So we probably need to revisit this issue and, and rethink um, what these numbers look like. I think they're gonna be much, much higher. Let me turn it over to Dana um, to give you the economist viewpoint. Uh, thank you, Jay. And uh, let me point out also that um, if, the, if you listen to the previous session, what you heard is that um, there was there's going to be a lot of concern in Washington about how you might find support for this issue. And so what I wanted to do is take you through, as Jay said, kind of a fiscal analysis of what you, how we might approach this. And I, I, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done when we talk about um, delaying uh, morbidity generally. But uh, to give you some flavor, uh, if any, any, t any legislation that might impact the dividend is going to go to the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, to be scored. And this is, uh, I wanted to walk people through an example. We modeled out two scenarios which had the flavor that if people arrived at age 50, 
and you could roll back the clock to the 1970s. So in the 1970s, the, the BMI was about five points lower than it is today. Uh, and so what we did is we modeled what would that mean fiscally? And the, ch the challenge here is that um, there actually are costs associated with intervening. And this is the problem in Washington, I would say, that notwithstanding the previous session, is that when you go to conferences like this, people are very excited about the prospect of people living longer. I served on the CBO's advisory panel for health, and there, there's a lot of hand wringing. And part of the problem is that when people live longer, it costs the government money. And the reason is, uh, and this came up with smoking, and you might ask, why is smoking even legal? And it's because the annuity costs, uh, mainly through Social Security, one could argue, would be so burdensome for the federal government that they can't do anything about it. So the question is, what would a CBO-like score look like for something that actually reduced obesity? And here's an example of how you might do it. There are some revenue effects. For example, uh, if you look at federal taxes, we, and this models out all the effects on a lifetime of economic and health outcomes, and I'm not gonna go through the details, but essentially, uh, a 50-year-old can be expected under the status quo to contribute about $46,000 in a lifetime context in federal tax as a result of uh, working in income tax. And in a healthier scenario, they could add maybe $1,400 to that. That is the scenario where they have lower obesity. And part of that is higher earnings and part of that is they work longer. And similarly, they're gonna increase uh, their contributions to state taxes. And they're also gonna increase their contributions to payroll taxes. And they're also gonna increase what they pay in Medicare taxes. And so the net effect here is that it increases by about $2,400 per capita. But as I said, there are some costs associated with that. Um, the first is that because they're living longer, Social Security, which is essentially what old age survivor insurance program, uh, is gonna pay out more. Here it's about $6,000. But there actually are some savings in Medicare that are gonna offset, uh, and some savings in Medicaid. And that's the important part of what Jay is talking about, that you pay less in disability. So when you add it up, you still have a reduction of about 5,000. You, you add in the increased revenue and the reduced expenditure, and what you get is that it's worth to the government about $5,000 per capita. And if you model this out uh, over time, what you see is Medicare and Medicaid, uh, there are savings. In Social Security, there are some costs, and the net fiscal impact, which is... Uh, should really go below. There, it turns out there are some savings to the government. Now, another problem with what CBO does is they only score out 10 years. Uh, and so we need to convince them that any intervention uh, needs to be modeled in a lifetime context. But the point is that if you do this right, you can convince the government that it actually will save them money long term. So, um, but the other point I want to make is, and it goes back to the hand wringing I was talking about, is that in order to get past the CBO uh, analysts, you, you focus on cost. But the real value here, and this is what Jay was referring to, is the value of the health improvement. Even if treating obesity had no federal cost savings, it could have tremendous social value. And so I just want to show you uh, an example of the type of analysis we did. And you can look across diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Uh, and what we find is that 100% effective obesity treatment would be worth trillions in the United States. And actually, if we could roll back the clock in the way we're talking about, it would be worth $52,000 to every 50-year-old. 
And the reason why this number matters is because when you talk about should we be investing in this area, well, the bottom line is if you had even a 10% chance of being able to address the ep obesity epidemic, then you should be spending 5,200, 10% of 52,000 for every 50 year old. And this doesn't even include all the other cohorts that are affected. And so when Jay says we dramatically underestimated, what I would say is this, this point says we should be investing literally hundreds of billions, if not trillions, uh, in prevention if you thought that it would have any effect. And so um, I'm gonna stop my share at this point. And I think we're happy to engage in a conversation, but what I would say, and this reflects what Congresswoman Shalala was talking about, we dramatically underinvest in prevention generally, and the playing field is really tilted against it, but the potential returns are huge. Actually, can I do one thing? Um, if, can, you, can you pull back up my, uh, my original image? Is it dueling images? Yeah, I just have the one. But So I want to make a point here, because um, I listened to some of the, as many of the presentations this morning as I could, all excellent, by the way. Um, and let me emphasize something. Since we are one week away from the Nobels being announced, let me, let me point something out to you. I'm a bit of a historian with re regard to public health. The, the vast majority of the increase in human longevity that occurred during the last 120 years was a result of uh, re reducing the effects of communicable diseases. And so if you look at the Nobel Prizes that were offered in the early part of the 20th century in medicine and physiology, most of them were focused on um, uh, infection, communicable diseases of one kind or another. You saw a shift over to genetics um, in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, and then, of course, in more recent time periods, we've seen some movement to what's going on in the world of chronic fatal diseases. But it basically mirrors what we've done to ourselves as a, as a population. And let me just emphasize the importance and the value of what's going on here, because somebody at this conference, I have no doubt whatsoever, is going, to, is going to earn a Nobel Prize for their work in an effort to modulate the biological process of aging. And the importance of this is so critically important. There have only been a couple of instances in, the, in history where public health has been influenced so dramatically by some event that has occurred early part of the 20th century, of course, we know it was basic public health, middle part of the 20th century, um, antibiotics, we had vaccines brought in, you know, Nobel Prizes were won for, for, for all of those. Recently, we, we saw a Nobel Prize go to work on identifying uh, the mechanism that was originally identified by Len Hayflick in his 1962 article on, uh, on, on uh, uh, cell replication. Uh, and so the work that's going on now in the field of aging has the potential, it will have an influence on public health that, that has the potential to be as influential, if not more so, than any of the major influencers in public health in the last 120 years, which have been enormous. Uh, so I am extraordinarily excited about the work that's going on. And maybe, maybe if we can get Dana to get away from doing his work as the dean, maybe we could move him in the direction of getting, you know, a Nobel in economics, uh, uh, right? If you could apply your lips to David. God's ears, that's all I'll say. Well, just look, the dean part, just the dean. Yeah, part. yeah. Well, look, this work th that's going on in the field of aging now, that's being described at this metabesi uh, metabesity conference, I think is is um, is profound. Yeah, uh, and it will have an influence on public health like nothing we've seen. Uh, in a long time, and it's extraordinarily exciting. And I think getting the folks in the world of medicine to understand and appreciate the value of this, I think, I think we are gaining some traction. Certainly, I mean, I gave a, a talk a couple, of, two years ago at the American Medical Association here in Chicago, all physicians, um, and they got it. 
they understood the concept um, and they appreciated this. And, you know, many of us went to, to Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago to meet with the, with the Food and Drug Administration. And the FDA got it. The scientists at the FDA were, were brilliant. And they were basically saying, we understand now that you can target aging, that you can, you can modulate this process, and it can have a multiple, an effect on multiple diseases simultaneously. So the folks at the FDA understood it. Um, they got it. Um, it's really the, the issue of getting the kind of funding that I think we need um, to make this happen. And I think Dana presents the perfect economic argument to support why it is that we should be drawing in the kinds of funds that are required to, to extend the period of, of uh, healthy life among future cohorts of older people. I do get some people, by the way, who say, well, if you succeed, you know, what about overpopulation or influencing the environment in some negative way? I'm going, look, you've got a choice here. Would you rather have a lot more unhealthy older people or a lot more healthy older people? The choice is obvious, and I think it's within our uh, control to influence this process. So. Let me uh, add something. So the, uh, there's a question that's often raised about um, whether we should be, uh, whether these returns over 50 years, should, we should be making these investments. And ironically, if you think about how economists view these things, you know, people say, why do we invest in education, especially higher education? It's because we know that the returns accrue over a lifetime. And that's why we educate people at a young age, because they have more time to accumulate the gains. And, but it's interesting when you think about prevention, because it's different than education. Because, you know, you might say, well, we should invest to, to prevent childhood obesity. But not everyone who's obese is going to accumulate some of the risk factors. And actually, what turns out is that when you look older at older ages, and often we set up what I would argue is this false dichotomy between investing in kids and investing in older ages, at older ages, people are at much higher risk. And so it turns out the near-term benefits of the investment are actually much higher. And you could see this if you just look at hypertension, for example, we have very good treatments that are very cheap for most people who are hypertensive. And it would be worth it to everyone if we just made sure people took their antihypertensives. And it would pay off to the Medicare program and it would pay off elsewhere. But because, for example, Medicare doesn't start till age 65, we've kind of ignored this issue. And because our health insurance contracts are annual, it doesn't seem like it's to everyone's advantage. So the question is, how do you design policies that would incentivize what is an obvious uh, benefit for society, which is to lower blood pressure for people at the ages, let's say, of 45 to 64? Now, if I come back to this, and, and the point also is that we've set up this false dichotomy between children and older adults because the, the result, the reality is it's worth it investing in both and we need to figure out how to do that. I was a bit surprised when the Trump administration first started, they said, well, we're going to address, um, we're going to uh, put all this money into infrastructure and most people think of infrastructure as bridges and roads and airports and the like. And maybe now that we have COVID, people will understand that actually our infrastructure includes our human capital, capital, not just our physical capital, and our health capital. And that means we should be making investments there as well. Hey, Dana, if we had a therapeutic intervention that could, could modulate aging in some way, um, do you have any idea at all how, it would have, how much it would have influenced uh, the amount of money that's being spent on COVID? Uh, right now? Have you yeah. worked on that at all? Uh, sorry, so uh, you mean if we had healthier people at older ages so that they'd be more robust and would survive the COVID crisis? Yeah, I mean, think of it this way, right? If you if you've have an intervention that somehow reduces the risk in half, right, because yeah. the, the mortality schedule 
for COVID is mirroring that of total mortality. So if you delay everything by seven years, you've cut everything in half. Yeah. Um, presumably this would have a huge impact on health and survival. Oh yeah, no, we, we so for example, even remdesivir, which all it does is kind of reduce modest effects on mortality, reducing it, but also keeping people out of the hospital is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So for example, if you, I mean the COVID, the COVID costs are so calamitous that everyone understands, you know, maybe on the order of $15 trillion that people understand this. And I think your point is because this uh, phenomenon uh, of um, uh, increased morbidity at older ages has happened over a longer period, we don't understand that it also has trillions of dollars in impact on society. Well, we, uh, but also keep in mind that we failed to take into consideration in our 2013 article, the impact of communicable diseases. We just completely left that out. And that was a mistake. Um, and I think we need to refactor that in and we will have to do the math on this. But when we do, I'm guessing that the numbers are going to be a whole lot greater than 7.1 trillion between now and 2050. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the numbers are staggering. I think you know, one of the ways we, it's easy to make this argument sometimes to Democrats uh, who believe in investing in kids. It's sometimes harder to make the argument in, in science. Uh, it's almost harder sometimes to do it on the Republican side, but we think it's important to make the argument on both sides of the aisle. So one of the things we did is we looked at these investments and we said, what are the returns if you were to compare it to the post-World War II stock market. And the post-World War II stock market yielded about 8% in real terms. And it turns out that these investments that you're talking about would yield about 15% when you start doing the math the way we're doing it. So if someone thinks the stock market is a good investment, then they should really like the longevity dividend. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to emphasize to the researchers out there, when you are justifying the investment that's being made by your company or your university or your organization in geroscience, longevity dividend, whatever we're gonna call it, um, I think that there's a very powerful argument that can be made using uh, many of the tools that Dana has developed that allow you to translate this uh, very effectively. Um, the one thing we need to avoid in our field, and this came up during the very first session, I think Matt Haberlein was making this point uh, very effectively, we need to avoid the exaggeration that is out in our field today, claiming that we're going to live to 150 or 200 or whatever we need, because as soon as you mention that, you, you know, you go in to speak to, 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 um, to, to anyone who's controlling any large funds, and you talk about living to 150 or 200, uh, you pretty much shut them down almost instantaneously. Uh, and I've run into this uh, personally. So I think staying away from the exaggeration um, enables us to really focus in on the real value. Uh, it's just not necessary, I, I think, to exaggerate, to justify what's going on in the field of aging science to slow the biological process of aging. Sure. So. Um... We're getting a lot of questions coming through, so I wanted to address some of them. The first is kind of uh, a couple of them have the flavor that we know things that might work, eating more healthy foods, uh, exercising more. And I'd like to say, you know, I, I, without these seem like obvious things to do, but the incentives aren't aligned. So if I come out and I figure out a way to mimic healthy food as a biopharma solution, so there's a shot that improves your nutrition, uh, then I get some patent protect protection and people are out there looking uh, at ways to do it. But if I figure out how to get people to go for a walk, which might mimic the exact same thing, then there's no protection on my idea. And so I'm not incentivized in the current system to figure out these behavioral modification solutions that actually might 
uh, uh, offers uh, some ideas. And so I think we really need to figure out how to tilt the playing field, so to speak. So we encourage investments in prevention. And the other part of it is that, you know, we have a health system that spends $2 trillion on sick care. And if I keep people out of the hospital, I'm not really rewarded. And we need to get to a system that rewards health, not healthcare. And, you know, that is a real challenge in the current model just tilts the playing field away against all of these ideas. And so Jay, one of the things you said was, we don't, we don't, people don't have realistic claims that are associated with things, but there are ways to make sure that you would design markets so that people would get rewarded over the long term for what they're doing. And I know you've done some work on that as have I, uh, you know, but, in systems where people are with their health insurers for a long time, we find that they invest more in prevention. So let me point out, I think it's, I think it's important to emphasize that the work that's going on in aging biology doesn't dismiss the low hanging fruit of eating less, exercising more, doing, you know, we, it's, it's not like we don't know what to do, right? We know that we should be reducing the prevalence of obesity and the severity of obesity. We know that. We know we should be, you know, we should stop smoking. If we do all of those things, we'll live a little bit longer than we do now. We're not going to be adding um, a whole lot to life expectancy in a long-lived population. The red zone will remain uninfluenced by those um, changes. And so you may experience a prolonged period of frailty and disability as a result of the very things that we're talking about. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be trying to lose weight and uh, that we, should, we should, shouldn't be quitting smoking. We should be. Um, but keep in mind that, that uh, many of us, I think, are now suggesting we've reached a point in long-lived populations like the U.S. where we may pay a price for the extended, for, uh, the extended survival further and deeper into the red zone. And that's the logic and the rationale behind this new approach. It's not, the new approach isn't designed to replace this effort to reduce obesity and smoking. It's designed to supplement it. It's designed, I think, to, to basically suggest, look, we've succeeded. We've created a long-lived population. We, we now have a life expectancy that's close to 80. We should be declaring success. That was the conclusion in my uh, JAMA article from 2018, declare success. We did it. We've now, you know, we, we now make it to, to, to a, lot, a, a significant part of the population makes it to very old age. Now let's focus on how healthy we are. And therein lies the value of aging biology because aging biology is primary prevention with a capital P. And I've got a paper with with that title to it, primary prevention with a capital P. If you want to go after the best way to attack all of the, these diseases simultaneously, whether they're fatal or disabling, the underlying biological process of aging is the way to go. And I think that logic and the rationale and the way in which we present it and the economic argument supporting it, I think when packaged up correctly is extraordinarily powerful. Um, to, uh, as a way to support the work that's going on um, in the field today. And I think that's where we come in. Um, so sure. I, I, I do think and, we need to revisit some of these issues. Yeah, and we're getting questions about this and we're getting scolded for not reading them. So one of the questions is how can we frame that? And I think the point is that if you look at the federal budget, about 50% of it is health spending and social security. In fact, the irony is about 80 plus percent of the, the budget is healthcare, annuities, and defense. So the United States is just a big insurer with a Navy. And so the, the way to address this is to say, look, we, we need to score, we need the economic returns on the longevity dividend and write this up. We have the tools to do it and then figure out and then go to Washington and make sure people understand it. And, you know, we have to address NIH, but we also have to work with legislators and the like, and, you know, also with the White House. And this stuff, our previous work, 
was in the economic report of the president uh, back during, I think, the Obama administration. And, you know, this, it needs to be cited again and dusted off. That would be my suggestion. And, but it has to be framed in a way that will make it past these crazy scoring uh, things that Congress does. Yeah, you know, the, um, I don't know if you're, you're aware of this, but the, the concept of the longevity dividend in Jero science was actually considered by the Obama administration um, two years before he left office. Um, we, we came to Washington to meet with one of the senators there to discuss this is issue. We asked her, uh, we asked uh, it was Claire McCaskill, uh, former Senator Claire McCaskill, um, if she would bring it to the president. And then we were actually contacted by um, one of the offices there that was considering this as one of the global challenges in health. He ended up going with, and I understand why he did this, ended up going with uh, the cancer moonshot because uh, Joe Biden had just lost his son. Um, and of course, we're making the argument, look, if you really want to go after cancer, go after aging. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to go after Alzheimer's, go after aging. Uh, and, and getting that concept across, I think, has been, has been difficult. But I think, th I think there has been uh, certainly some, some traction. Well, I think it's a false dichotomy, in my view, because, you know, they, they always have people who uh, represent each of the diseases. Reagan had Alzheimer's, uh, Joe Biden's son had cancer. The point is we want to invest in disease specific treatments because we have um, a social imperative to do that. But if you really want to move the needle on making America healthier in the way you're talking about, you have to address all these competing risks and that leads you to this issue. And I think that I, I, I don't like to frame it as we shouldn't invest in cancer, we should invest in biology of aging. I think the point is we've just underinvested in the biology of aging. Dramatically. To, to double or triple that would be a drop in the bucket compared to, uh, you know, investment again in physical infrastructure. So I think you, you would, I would make the argument if you put one aircraft carrier up against this issue, it would be of great value, so. Well, how about the salary of one uh, professional football player? Um, <laughs> you know, seriously, I mean, you could, you know, you could, if you start out with, with, with something, uh, it's actually not a trivial sum depending on the player. Um, <laughs> It's, it's an enormous amount of money relative to what's being, being spent today. Now, truth be told, I am, not, I, would, I am much more optimistic that the money that is going to make this happen is going to come from, uh, the, pr from uh, the private sector, not from uh, the government. Right. Uh, because I, 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 you know, as much as I, I you know, like, like the NIH and, and, and the NI National Institute on Aging, and I'm extraordinarily supportive, it's too slow, too little, and too slow. And I think the potential um, for huge returns on investment um, is one of the reasons why so much money is heading in this direction. And I think that is where, is where we should be going. It's where the emphasis should be, um, in my view, because I think that's likely to be the most successful in generating a return. I do want to be mindful, right? So we do need to answer some of these questions. Yeah, but let me just say, since you brought it up, the, this is an important point. Once as an economist, you see the private sector investing, then you know there are legitimate returns that are worth pursuing. And the other thing is that it becomes very important that the regulatory authorities, especially the FDA, uh, would actually uh, make an effort to, the FDA, previously has practiced risk minimization in this area. So they're very afraid of any treatment that's given to healthy people. And so people have started to test these things in patients who already have disease. And I really think we need to figure out a way to say, how do we test compounds in healthy populations to maintain that health? And that is not risk minimization, that's risk management. And that that's a longer discussion that'll take us a field. Well, th so this issue came up during the meeting that took place with the uh, folks at the FDA. And I have to be honest 
with you. The folks at the FDA, um, when Steve, Steve Osted, I think, and Nir Barzil, I were discussing this specifically with them. The FDA was very clear. They said, how can we help? They were not uh, standing in the way at all. They were, you know, they were marvelous. How can we help? Uh, because they understood uh, all of this. So I think we have an ally uh, in the FDA. They get the concept of geroscience and longevity dividend. It, it just makes makes sense to them. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that, that, that uh, we will get enough funding uh, to make this happen. There has been a considerable amount um, uh, uh, invested just in the last couple of years uh, in this area. It's exciting to see. You know, uh, and a, a number of new developments have occurred. I mean, you know, the work that's going on at the Mayo Clinic on senolytic compounds is extraordinarily exciting. Um, there's just an enormous amount that's that's uh, that's a, to be excited about in the field. Um, Jay, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, can you name names about some of the helpful FDA and other people that you've uh, come across? Um, so I would. So asking me to remember a name from uh, <laughs> from five years ago is like you know I don't, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. But um, what I can do tell you to do is to uh, go to the uh, National National Geographic uh, had a wonderful video that came out uh, I think it was three four years ago where they followed a bunch of us around for a while talking about all of these issues. It's, I think it's called the Age of Aging. And um, I, the only that name the that Ron I, Howard film. Yeah, it was the Ron Howard film, and the only name I remember from the FDA was Dr. Temple. And Dr. Dr. Temple was interviewed at the end, and his language was unambiguous, and he understood it completely. And I can tell you, they, you know, they couldn't videotape in the meeting because it, it's it, it, they were the FDA doesn't allow that. Um, but you know, a handful of us were in there, and they were they were bending over backwards to be supportive. How can we help? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe near and uh, near Barzilai and Steve Ostad and some of the others that participated will know the names of the other folks there. But I was very impressed. Well, Ronald him. Reagan famously said the four most dangerous words in the English language are I'm from the or I'm from the, the most dangerous sentence. I'm from the government. How can I help? So sorry. We're here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> Dana or Jay, could you take a look at the questions box and at least we have, we're down to a minute, minute and a half. Uh, at least answer one question in the question and answer box or in the chat. Uh, uh, well, I'm see one question. Am I missing something? Yeah, I think I think people have asked uh, in both places, uh, chat yeah. and questions. No, I think I, I think the problem is we do not pay sufficient returns to innovation in some of these areas. You know, cancer has historically been uh, well reimbursed because of strange, perverse policies. But the result of that is we got a ton of innovation in that area, and the reality is the dollars do follow the reimbursement. And obesity and frailty and osteoarthritis traditionally have not had the reimbursement. So people are worried about drug prices, but my point is that innovation follows that and we have to figure out a way to balance these things. And the right answer is to figure out how to pay for results, not for product. Let me, let me point out uh, a question from Michael uh, Nuchke. Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, how important is widespread public support of extending health span? It's critical, um, absolutely critical. And uh, communicating to the general public has been difficult because that, well, most of the time when I've done it, you know, folks are coming up to me saying, why would we want to make more unhealthy older people? And I, I you know, I, I keep saying, look, look at the red zone. Our goal is not to push the blue line out. It's to compress the red zone. It's to transform a 70, you know, we want, to, we want it to take, uh, you know, 70 years to become 50 and 80 years to become 60. We want to be healthier for longer. And I think once we communicate that simply and effectively, it addresses the issue that, that Michael is, is talking about. It's been the hardest thing is to get folks to really understand what it means to slow aging. Slowing aging is not, it, it just means remaining healthier 
longer staying more, you know, retaining your youthful vigor for a longer time period and communicating that effectively has been the challenge. It's critical. Gentlemen, thank you so much for a lively discussion. Loved hearing your dinner together over drinks talking about this topic. I could listen to you guys for hours.